Hi, welcome to Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'm Jeremy Yoder, and today I'm going to show you how to manage your fire. No, this isn't an ad for Kingsford, but I did get some Kingsford briquettes, and that's exactly how we're going to start our fire. I have a charcoal chimney. I'm going to take some of these briquettes, fill it up, and I got some newspaper that are crumpled up underneath. I'm going to light that on fire and get these going. And it's just the easiest way I've found to start a wood-fired smoker. If you are using another kind of smoker, chances are, unless it's a, a gas assist or an electric assist smoker, you're using charcoal as a heat source. So, I'm just going to pour these briquettes into this chimney. Now I filled up this charcoal chimney all the way to the top with just regular Kingsford blue bag briquettes. You could use their competition briquettes, you could use uh, lump charcoal, anything you want to use is totally fine, but just to start the fire, I like to use briquettes just because they're easy. If I'm actually using it in the cooker, if I'm putting uh, charcoal into the cooker, I like to use lump charcoal. I think it burns a little hotter, uh, burns cleaner, and there aren't really any fillers or adjuncts that they add to the lump charcoal, but for our purposes, this is gonna work perfectly fine. So I've got some newspaper crumpled up in the bottom of the chimney, and I got this lighter, and I'm just gonna light it up and let it go until the ashes cover all the charcoal. We're going to let these briquettes go. They're going to keep heating because the heat's going to rise and light the briquettes above the layer that's already lit and we're going to let it go until they're all lit and it'll probably be maybe 20 to 30 minutes before they're ready to go. We can take those and then throw them in the smoke box, throw some wood on there and we'll be ready to cook soon. All right, it's been about 30 minutes, and you can see flames are starting to pop out of the top of the chimney, and that tells me that it's ready to use. All the charcoals are lit on the bottom, except for maybe a couple on the top, but that's not really a huge deal. So we can take this and pour it into our firebox, and then we can add some wood and, and get to smoking some meat. So I'm just gonna pour these in. Pretty easy. When I'm pouring these briquettes, inside the firebox here. I want this main lid open, but this door back here I want closed. So I could have it open, but I could also lose some briquettes that fall out if I leave that open, which is not a good situation. This vent right here, I want to leave it all the way open right now while I'm trying to get my fire started, everything lit, everything heating up. And I also want to keep the lid to the main grate open, and I want to keep this all the way open as well. Doing this right now is just to get maximum airflow. Just open everything up, and plus I don't want a bunch of dirty gross smoke going through the smoker when it's not cooking or when it's cooking. So, now I've got my coals going. I have a pecan log, and this is an appropriate size for this smoker. It's on the, the larger end of what this could take, but um, this definitely wouldn't work in a, in a little bitty smoker. So, take this, put it on those coals, let them get going. The best way to get to the temperature you want is to actually go over the temperature. Say today I want to cook at 275. So what I'm going to do is keep going until I get to about 300 and then settle down into the temperature I want to cook at of 275. What I find is this tends to keep the temperature more consistent. It's not fluctuating like crazy and it's easier to to go down a little bit to your cooking temperature than to be under your cooking temperature and then try to feed the fire but maybe get it too hot, etc. So that's what we're gonna do. Looks like our log is starting to catch fire over here. All right, now it's, it's caught enough flame, it's lit well enough that I can close this down, I'm not really worried about it at all. I'm gonna close this main lid, that firebox lid down, and I'm also gonna close the main lid down and let it start drafting hot air. All right, while you're, while you're cooking, you definitely want to leave this vent open so lots of airflow gets through. Or you may even want to open your firebox door a little bit. Um, you could cook with your firebox door wide open if you wanted to, just depending on how much fuel you have in there and how hot you're trying to cook. And so what I usually do is I leave the vents wide open because that still provides lots of airflow and I don't usually lose a lot of smoke coming back out this way. So I 
I like to close it down, leave that pretty much wide open, and I control the temperature by controlling the amount of fuel. And the reason I do it that way is because one of my biggest goals in doing barbecue is to burn a clean fire. And what that means is burning a fire that has plenty of oxygen, so you don't produce off flavors or off tastes in the smoke and therefore in the meat. So by burning it with plenty of oxygen, you produce the fabled thin blue smoke that everybody's looking for. But a side product of that is you produce uh, the tastiest molecules when you're burning the wood. The wood will produce different kinds of molecules based on how much oxygen it's getting. If it's getting hardly any oxygen, it'll produce lots of thick white smoke, and that's not really what you want for your barbecue. If it's getting plenty of oxygen, it'll produce a very pale, almost blue smoke that's it's almost see-through, and that's exactly what you're looking for. So what we've done is we put some meat on the smoker. I let the, the temperature go up to about 300 degrees, and then I'll let it ease back down to 275, which is right where we wanted to cook it. We cooked, uh, well, we're in the process of cooking a couple pork butts, if you wanna take a look at them. And they are smelling good. Make a puppy want a polo freight train. Uh, I've had the main lid open to the cook chamber, so the heat went down because of that, and the fire's just, just down to coals now, and so we need to add a little bit more wood to the fire. Now, what I've done, is something that I would actually recommend if you can. I've taken a big pan that I use and I've filled it with water. So people a lot of times will put a water pan in the cook chamber, but if I put it directly over the flames, what happens is you produce more water vapor, right? more steam going through the cook chamber. And so doing this is just kind of a more intense version of putting a water pan in the cook chamber. So that's what I've done. And it also kind of holds the heat more steady. So if the fire gets really hot, the water's gonna absorb a lot of that heat become water vapor and flow through the cook chamber and if the fire starts to cool down it's going to be at least 212 degrees in this thing of water because it's the boiling point of water so it's going to keep it from getting way too low if you neglected the fire for too long it's kind of like if you go to the beach it's always cooler at the beach in the summertime and it's always a little bit warmer in the winter time because the water holds the temperature steady and so those are some of the reasons why i put the water pan right in here but we need to put some wood on the fire. So I'm gonna open up this fire grate back here. And if you wanna get a look at the coals there, you can see how much they've dwindled down. Almost nothing left in there. So I'm gonna take a couple, couple logs, toss them on there, and they'll catch in just a minute. But until they do, I'm gonna leave this main door to the firebox open so that all the white smoke that's coming off of this is it's gonna catch. It will uh, will not go cover the meat and coat it in smoke that we don't want. So I'm gonna blow on the coals a little bit just to get it started. And that didn't take too much wood or too much effort at all. We'll let that catch pretty well in maybe two or three minutes from now. I'll close that up. I think the, I'm gonna let the wood go for maybe another hour or so. When you're barbecuing, there are three important principles when it comes to fire management. Number one is maintaining a clean fire. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Rule number two is you wanna build a fire that's appropriate to the size of your cooker. If you've got a huge offset cooker, then yeah, you can burn big logs in it. And that's no problem. But if you've got a tiny little charcoal kettle grill, you don't want to stick huge logs on your fire. It's going to end in disaster. And also, if you've got a big offset smoker, you wouldn't want to use tiny wood chips. It's just not the kind of fire you'd want to burn. So maintain a fire that's appropriate to your kind of smoker. And then the third key to proper fire management is maintaining a steady temperature. You're going to have big problems if you have a fire that's really low, maybe 180 degrees, and then 350 degrees. You have to maintain a consistent temperature if you want to have successful barbecue. Now, if you follow those three steps, you're going to have great barbecue every time. But if you don't, you're going to ruin everything you've spent hours and hours working for. The first principle of great fire management is maintaining a clean fire. So if you look over here at the smokestack right here, 
there's smoke coming out of it, yes, but there's not really thick white smoke. It's just very, very thin. It's, it's basically transparent, and that's exactly what you want. What that means is that your wood is burning efficiently, and the wood burns efficiently when it actually bursts into flame. So generally speaking, when you're smoking meat, you don't want slow, smoldering wood chunks because that produces a kind of smoke that's not what you're looking for when you're smoking meat. When wood burns, and it's got plenty of oxygen, it burns hot. And when it burns hot, it gets closer to what's called complete combustion. And what that means is that all of the wood is completely burned and converted into carbon dioxide and water vapor. Now, if it were all converted to carbon dioxide and water vapor, then it would be exactly the same as a propane grill, right? There's no extra flavor there. The flavor comes from when things aren't completely converted into carbon dioxide and water. And if you're burning a hot fire, those extra compounds that get made are the ones that you want. They're the ones that make meat taste really sweet, decadent, kind of that smoke flavor that everybody just naturally likes. Those are the good compounds that you want. Now, if you're burning a smoldering fire or you're choking a fire off of all of its oxygen, it'll taste over-smoked, it'll taste really bitter, the food will taste acrid, and you don't want that at all. And so all the hard work and all the time that you put into it will be completely wasted because you weren't burning the right kind of fire. Now, to burn a clean, consistent fire, it requires a couple of things. It requires enough space, it requires enough oxygen, and it requires enough time to get the flavor onto the meat. Now, if you come over here and look at the firebox here, I can show you what kind of fire I'm burning. So if you open this guy up here, you look inside, I don't have a lot of fuel in there, right? But it's all burning in flames, or else it's all burned down to coals, which means that the fire has had plenty of oxygen, it's not smoldering away and producing a kind of heavy, dense white smoke that won't flavor the meat well. It's producing the exact kind of smoke that you want. And no matter what kind of smoker you have, you want clean smoke because that's the smoke taste that won't taste bitter, it won't taste acrid, and it won't ruin your food. Principle number two, building a fire that's appropriate to your kind of smoker. I have a couple different fuels uh, that can be used for barbecuing meat and we'll talk about each one of those individually. But first let's talk about a couple different kinds of smokers that there are. Here you have an offset smoker, it's quarter inch thick steel, a pretty traditional way of doing barbecue in the United States. Other kinds of barbecue pits that are popular are pellet smokers where everything is automated and it controls the temperature for you. There are kettle grills that people use to smoke their meat if they don't have a dedicated smoker. And one of the most popular varieties of smokers is the Weber Smoky Mountain. And you can get those in three different sizes. It's, it's kind of like a stainless steel version of a big green egg. It's set up vertically like this and it's long and tall so that you can separate the meat from the heat below it so that the meat can cook more indirectly than from a direct flame. So let's take a look at some of the different fuels you could use when you're barbecuing meat. Number one is probably the most familiar to everybody. Here I have just a charcoal briquette. You can buy these in basically any hardware store. You can buy them in basically any grocery store. And it's probably the most common fuel for grilling besides propane. Now you'll use these. Uh, I use them to start fires in an offset smoker like this. You can use them as your primary fuel source if you're cooking in a kettle grill. Or you probably will use it as your primary heat source if you're cooking on a Weber Smoky Mountain, something like that. And these are really versatile and super helpful because they're so convenient. Now, they may not be the best source in terms of flavor, but in terms of convenience, they're hard to beat. They're rivaled by lump charcoal, which I don't have any on hand right now. But lump charcoal is basically a product that goes into making briquettes. What they do is they take wood and they heat it without oxygen present, so it all carbonizes and turns into this black stuff. And to make the briquettes, they take that carbonized wood, which is lump charcoal, and they pulverize it. They turn it into tiny little pieces, and then they add a couple binders to it and form a briquette so that they are easily transported. They're all the same size and shape and can be used in all kinds of different grills. Now, the next thing I would like to talk about is if you have a small grill, something like a, uh, a Weber kettle, or maybe even a Weber Smoky Mountain, though I wouldn't recommend this, is some wood chips. Now wood chips you can buy at a lot of grocery stores, you can buy them 
at a lot of hardware stores and they can come in several different varieties. You can get apple wood, hickory wood, uh, cherry wood, pecan wood, and any number of different woods. And so that's a big plus in terms of convenience. And so these, what people do usually is soak them so that they'll smoke for longer and then they throw them on an already burning charcoal fire to provide extra smoke because the charcoal itself won't really provide smoke, it'll provide almost entirely heat. Now the next fuel I'd like to talk about are pellets. If you have a pellet cooker, you know what these are. If you don't have a pellet cooker, you might not. All these are, are compressed sawdust. So if you look at them, they split apart really easily. You can tear them apart. There are no binders. There are no adjunct fillers or anything like that. It's just wood that they put under huge pressure in order to form these pellets. And you put those in a pellet cooker, and that's about the most convenient way to smoke any meat. You fill up the auger with lots of pellets, you set the temperature, and you walk away and can come back in 12 hours when your meat is done. If you have something like a big green egg, where you're using charcoal and then chunks of wood to provide smoke, or if you have a Weber Smoky Mountain, what I would recommend is using charcoal as your main heat source, and then using wood chunks that are about this size. They can be anywhere from this size to about the size of a baseball. And you layer it through your charcoal so that it provides smoke consistently throughout the whole cook. And finally, if you have something like a big offset smoker, which I don't have a big one, I have maybe a medium sized one, you can use wood logs. Now this is probably a little big for what I would want to use. I probably would take an axe in and split this up and maybe use it as two chunks of wood. But it's a log nonetheless. And so this would not work in any of those other cookers that I just talked about. But for an offset cooker, logs are an ideal fuel source. They burn for a long time, they provide great flavor, and they won't burn up the food inside because the food is separated all the way from here to here. Because your fire is here and the smoke and heat have to travel so it won't burn up your meat on this side of the cooker. And this is probably my favorite fuel source. I think it provides the best flavor and the best smoke characteristics when you burn real wood with a real fire. And to me, the ultimate measure of what barbecue really is, is are you smoking meat with a real fire? And that's why I chose an offset stick burner. And that's why I burn these logs. And I think I make great barbecue. Principle three, maintaining a consistent temperature. A couple of things go into maintaining a consistent temperature. Number one is, getting a quality smoker. If you buy a $99 smoker at Lowe's or Home Depot, that's not a bad way to get started just so you're used to how everything works and the basic process of smoking meat. But if you want to have real success doing it and don't want to burn up or undercook everything you're trying to do, what I'd recommend is investing some real money, maybe five, six, seven hundred dollars depending on exactly what kind of smoker you're looking for, to get something that really works well. You could get a Weber Smoky Mountain for maybe 300 bucks. You could get a Big Green Egg for a whole lot more than that, or you could get a quality offset smoker for $1,000 or maybe a little bit more. All of those, if you buy quality, will reward you in the end, and you'll be glad you spent the money because you won't be ruining meat the same way you would be if you had bought a cheap offset smoker or a cheap bullet smoker or something like that. So to maintain temperature, first buy something of quality. The second thing you need to do is learn your pit. You have to know how your smoker works because one smoker doesn't work exactly the same as another. Yes, they work on the same principles. Oxygen and fuel go in and smoke and heat come out, yes. But you have to know exactly how your smoker is going to cook. So you have to know what altering this vent does versus altering the vent that lets air into the firebox. You have to know how those will affect the temperature and the quality of smoke that you're producing. All of those things go into maintaining a temperature. And so for this smoker here, I always want to keep the fire door vent open because I want the air to go in and burn a clean fire. And this one is the one I'll adjust if I want to regulate the temperature. If it's getting a little too hot, I'll close this down a little bit so the air isn't flowing through quite as quickly and the temperature will come down a little bit. If you don't know your smoker yet, just do a couple dry runs where you just burn some wood in it and you see how it maintains temperature. And one thing that can really, really help you in doing that is to get an accurate digital thermometer. What I've got here, I picked up 
at a local barbecue store. I really needed one one day and so I just went in and this is the only one that they had. And it's the big green egg version of what I believe is the Maverick digital wireless thermometer. And so this is super convenient because it's wirelessly connected to another monitor inside that I can watch as I'm you know, watching TV or eating something or taking a nap. I can wake up and look at it and see what my pit is doing outside. It's super convenient and I would highly recommend it. Spend the money and get a good digital thermometer. If you want to look at what's going on inside, there are two things. Number one is I'm measuring the temperature of the smoker at great level. And number two is I'm measuring the temperature of the meat at the same time. So I know how hot the pit is cooking and how hot my meat is. And if you want to manage your fire well, you need to know both of those because you don't want to overcook your meat and you don't want your fire to get too hot or too cool. Both of those are essential to making great barbecue. Now, the third thing I would say is this. Get a reliable analog thermometer. A lot of people might say, oh, well, that's not really important. Just use your digital thermometer. For me, it's just a, an incredibly convenient tool. I know about how far off this will be from my digital thermometer. So right now, since I opened the lid, it's, the temperature is really low. But usually this is running about 25 degrees cooler than the temperature at rate level. So I can just take a look at this and see from a distance exactly what the temperature is. Or sometimes for shorter cooks, I don't feel like going through the whole hassle of pulling out my big green egg thermometer and watching the fire and making sure everything's set up and then taking the probes inside and washing them. It's just too much hassle sometimes for a short cook. So I want an analog thermometer that's reasonably reliable so I know that I'm not burning up my meat and I know that it's not too cool. Some people might claim that they can run a fire just by, just by feeling it or something. I don't know what kind of witchcraft that is, but I, I don't have it and it's kind of beyond my capacity. I, I can't deal with that. So I need something to tell me what the temperature is. So invest in a good analog thermometer, but especially important is to invest in a good digital thermometer because this is going to be the most accurate and the most helpful way for you to produce good barbecue every time. We're back out here at the smoker now because the temperature of the smoker has dropped down to about 240. So I'm going to stick another log on the fire because my target temperature is 275. And so I chose kind of a small one because 240 isn't that far away from 275. And one thing about offset smokers like this is you put a log on the fire, it's not going to go up to 275 and stay right there until the log is completely burnt and then go back down. What it is, is you put the log on, it's going to heat up until it reaches a peak and then it's gradually going to come back down. So I don't want that peak to be too high and burn up my meat, so I chose a small one and I'll stick it on the fire right here. Got some coals there, just set it on the coals and in no time at all you should be burning and uh, ready to go. And so if it doesn't catch right away, if it looks like it's going to smolder for a while, I'll open up the lid to the firebox because I don't want a bunch of gross smoke going into the cook chamber. But this looks like it should be ready to go in just a couple minutes here, maybe maybe less than that. Let me, let me blow on these coals and get them started. Yeah, that's going to be no problem at all. So I'm going to close this back up and it's going to be going in no time and there's nothing to worry about there. At this point, I've already wrapped my meat. If you want to take a look at it, it's wrapped in there. So all I'm really worried about is keeping a steady temperature. Don't want to get it too hot or let it go too low. But the quality of the smoke isn't a huge deal right now because the meat's not going to absorb any more smoke. And we're just treating this just like an oven at this point. So in order to do that, we're going to have to add a little bit more wood to the fire. And it's going to be the exact same process that we do every time. I got some coals down here, and the fire right now is actually pretty low. It's about 200 degrees because I came out here and wrapped the meat and took care of all that. So I'm going to stick two chunks of wood on the fire and let these catch. And one thing that's really helpful to you if you're trying to manage a fire like this is to have something to poke the fire with. This is actually made for a big green egg but I find it works really well because I can adjust the fire. I can move the logs around, move the coals around, scrape the coals, and then after I'm done, I use this to scrape out all the ashes from the firebox. But now we gotta get those logs burning, and because it doesn't really matter if the smoke isn't you know, the world's cleanest right now because our meat is wrapped, what I'm gonna do is close this down and come over here, and I'm gonna blow on the coals inside just to get those lit.
what can happen if you've uh, neglected the fire for too long, if you maybe you took a nap and didn't wake up when you had planned to, or something like that, what can happen is all the coals burn down so much that when you take a log and put it on, you have a really, really hard time of getting it to catch. And it could be that you can't get it to catch fire and just smolders for a while and you can't get any more heat. What to do in that situation is, what I would do is I would have some smaller wood chips or small wood chunks that you can place on the fire that will get the fire going again because the last thing you want is in the middle of your cook to have to build a fire again from scratch. So if you keep some small pieces of wood and then maybe wood chunks, you can put it on the fire and get it going again before you put another log on. Uh, if everything completely goes out, if you're trying to cook overnight and you accidentally slept for four hours and everything is completely out, you're going to have to go through the whole process of starting the fire again. You might have to light some charcoals, put it in, put some wood on, and get the whole thing started again and you do not want that to happen. So be diligent to check your fire, make sure you're watching the temperatures, make sure it doesn't dip down too low, or else you're gonna have a bear of a time fixing it. And so it's the next day. Yesterday, we finished our cook. We let the temperature hold steady until the meat was completely finished. And then I left everything open so that the, the coals would just burn the rest of the way out. Because in my experience, if you try to choke it all off and it's not choked off completely, the embers will keep burning for sometimes even two days. So I left everything open and just let everything burn to ashes. And so this morning, I'm gonna clean out all those ashes. And this is something that's really important to do because if you leave the ashes in there, it can start to uh, eat through the metal because it pulls in water and starts to rust it. So what we're gonna do is clean out everything in there. You might even wanna get a paintbrush and get all the little dust particles out of there too that are the ashes from the fire just to clean up that fire box and make sure that your cooker doesn't start to rust. 